So phase one is identify the issues, the damps and the pamps. Phase two is treat it. Phase three is put the fire out because the other thing we know that once these cells are upregulated, they will stay upregulated for extended periods of time. The older you are, the longer it's been in the system, the longer it stays upregulated, the more work we have to do. So how do we go about working someone up? All right, here's your flow chart. In your history, you're looking for exposure to toxins, pathogens. You're looking for evidence of gut dysbiosis. You're looking for evidence of hypoxia, the most common cause of which is sleep apnea. And you're looking for medications that may be contributing to the problem. Knowing this piece of information, knowing what we know from the physiology, this is guiding our history. And then that guides our testing. Okay, and we can look for heavy metals and mold toxins and other environmental toxins. We can look for infectious diseases. We can look at the health of the gastrointestinal system, sleep studies, and genomic testing. And why genomic testing? Because when you get people who come to you and tell you that they've taken 15 different medications and have not reacted to them properly or have had problems with them, probably they're not metabolizing them. And so this also starts to bring us more to an individualized medicine. It's not about one size fits all. It's about understanding the individual with the disease and then figuring out how to treat it according to what their needs are. And those needs may involve understanding the specifics of what they can metabolize, what they can't metabolize, and what their genetic susceptibilities are. Okay? Not listed on this, but within the concept of genetics is conditions such as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Okay? Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, there's a subset of these individuals who will develop chronic pain syndromes. We do not understand all the specifics of why that is, but we know that it's there, and so part of your diagnostic workups is you need to look for these people because they're far more common than you would normally think. And one of the ways you identify them is they are really flexible, okay? Bite and score is one way to go about doing it. Can you take your thumb and pull it down to your wrist? Can you hyperextend your little finger to 90 degrees with your hand uh, flat on the table? Can you hyperextend your elbows by 10 degrees or your knees by 10 degrees? Can you place your palms flat on the ground without bending your knees. I cannot do any of the above. I am the opposite of whatever EDS is. But you also have to pay attention to the bite and scale is not the be all and end all. I had one young woman come in who could not get her hands down flat on the ground. But she said, I can do this. And she hops on the table, flat on her belly, takes her ankles, pulls them up over her, her back, and wraps them around her neck in a perfect circle. I said, that'll count. <laughs> so you have to look, because these people who, are, who have EDS3 are more susceptible to developing chronic pain syndromes. Other things that we need to look at is autoimmune problems, celiac disease, Hashimoto's, Sjogren's, lupus. We need to be looking at psychological issues. OK, if you're not looking for psych, if you're not willing to talk to a patient about a history of psych, in the issues of abuse, okay, then you have no business dealing with chronic pain. A very high percentage of the patients we see with chronic pain struggle with psychological issues. They have been abused in childhood. They have had problems. The number one cause of PTSD, car accidents, not military service. About 80% of people who are involved in a significant car accident will have PTSD for one year following that, and about 50% of those individuals will not completely recover. So PTSD. But you can get PTSD from the disease itself, from all of the medical interventions that have occurred. We have had people who are so needle phobic because of trauma that they've had suffered at the, at the hands of the profession. That needs to be addressed. It's still in the system. All right. When I'm treating someone and they're breaking into tears and shaking as we start to talk about the event, that's PTSD, even though the event was 15 years ago. So you've got to be prepared to deal with that because that's a very important layer in terms of what's going on with these individuals. It is a very simple equation. Pay me now or pay me later. Cheaper paying now. You have to be willing to deal with this stuff and confront it and work with it. And doing this kind of work is key to the work that we do. Some of the PTSD is introduced by the profession, as I said. Some of it is introduced by very difficult childhoods or any of a number of traumas that people can sustain throughout their lives. 
So you have to be prepared to talk about this stuff. And you really need to be working in conjunction with a therapist who gets this stuff. Metabolic issues. We already know that we're going to see disruption um, in the endocrine system by virtue of problems that occur with inflammation in the central nervous system, but we also know that these can create problems. And we also need to pay attention to things like MTHFR because without properly methylated folic acid, the nervous system doesn't work well. So uh, testing genetically for things like MTHFR and metabolic syndrome, all of these can feed into a chronic pain situation. Ischemia that we can see with cardiovascular accidents and POTS because POTS, what happens is technically what should happen is your heart rate goes up in order to try and maintain your blood pressure. But you can also see that blood pressure drop. Okay, and when that starts happening, aside from the fact that they'll pass out because the heart rate doesn't go high enough in order to maintain it, you've got an ischemic situation. So POTS has to be looked for, properly evaluated, and treated. All kinds of allergies. Remember, we now have the mast cells as part of our problem or at least potentially part of that problem. So now we've got to be paying attention to allergies that are coming into play here as well, because those will activate the mast cells. So again, testing is dire directed by your history, and all of this starts to give us insight as to how we go about treating these individuals. So now the history is massive, isn't it? The history isn't just about how long is your knee hurt. The history is about you. It's about the whole history of how you got to where you are today and which of these factors are coming into play. And we do lots of different testing. So we may do heavy metal testing in people. This is a test for mold toxicity. This is looking at the functioning of the adrenal hypothalamic pituitary axis, the adrenal stress index. We do organic acid testing. This is a metabolomics test that allows us to look for overgrowth of bacteria and yeast in the gut, but it also allows us to look at metabolic functioning for a large number of other processes going on in the body. Uh, this is an example of a SIBO test. So now we're looking at gut function in particular around here, so small bowel bacterial overgrowth that can come into play. And we're also looking at a diversity of issues with regards to the gut. Is there adequate pancreatic enzymes? Are you digesting your fats? What is the level of butyrate and small chain fatty acids in your gut? What's the diversity in your gut? Not so good, all right? Do you have other infections? And in this particular case, we see problems with parasitic infections that are going on. All right, and you'll be amazed when you look how many times you find these things that people didn't tell you they had or didn't even know they had. They've always had, you know, since that travel overseas, they've always had a little bit of disruption of their gut. But now you go look and you find fairly significant parasitic in infections. So you go look, you find. Phase two, treat the issue. Treat what you find during your history and testing. This is a whole nother lecture unto itself, and we're not going into the details of this, but now you know where you're going to look. Now you know what questions to ask and how to find it. Now the issue we're left with is putting out the fire. So as far as once the microglia are upregulated, what do we do to shut the process down? All right, there's a lot of things. There are a number of medications that we can use. So low-dose naltraxone, Celebrex, minocycline, amitriptyline, Paroxetine, these are medications that can be used to help downregulate the microglia. There are studies ongoing trying to find specific medications that will help reduce the microglia. Cannabis, CBD, actually reduces the activity of the microglia and can be effective. THC is what gets you high. CBD is what can help you with pain and anxiety and depression because it's a neuroinflammatory disease. There's a large number of supplements that can also be effective. And again, the studies back this. It's not just a matter of our personal experience, and certainly that comes into play, but the studies back the use of melatonin, glutathione, quercetin, coumatin, ginkgo, resveratrol, omega-3s, and vitamin D. And I was just reading some articles today looking at vitamin D in terms of improvement of osteoarthritic pain and improvement of cartilage function uh, in people who are struggling with knee pain of osteoarthritis. So maintenance of high normal vitamin D levels is crucial in order for health, not just in the immune system, but also in the cartilage of the body. What dosages are we talking about? This is generally the stuff that we go looking for and the dosages that we we'll use for this. All right, the omega-3 fatty acids, we use anywhere from a gram and a half to nine grams a day. Vitamin D levels, 
my reading of the literature, while uh, literature says 30 nanograms per mm is adequate, I think that people are healthier in my reading of the literature when I keep them between 50 to 60. Liposomic uh, glutathione, N-acetylcysteine. The major antioxidant in the central nervous system is glutathione. Glutathione has a rate limiting step of the availability of cysteine groups. Glutathione administered IV or orally is helpful but doesn't have a real long half-life in the system. We can certainly use it in more acute detox situations. But if we're going to do longer term, if we can get people to tolerate it, the N-acetylcysteine donates to cysteine groups across the blood-brain barrier and allows for the accumulation of glutathione in the system. CoQ10, ginkgo, all of these are important antioxidants in the system, inclusive of melatonin. In terms of the mast cells, we want to look at H1 and H2 blockers, antihistamines and antacids. Now, the H2 blockers are not the uh, proton pump inhibitors, which are the most commonly used antacids uh, in the system. Uh, the ones that are available over the counter are the, H, uh, the H2 blockers, not the proton pump inhibitors. Now, there's a problem with that because if I start shutting down the acid production in the stomach, screwing up the gut microbiome. So I'm caught in a catch-22, and you really have to give a lot of thought as to what you want to do about that. Other things that will shut down the mast cells, ketotiffin. Ketotiffin is an antihistamine that is not available as such in the United States because it's fairly sedating but can be compounded. Using one to two milligrams of this at bedtime, it has the advantage of not just blocking the histamine receptor, but it helps stabilize the mast cell. So it quiets the mast cell from overreaction. There's a number of the H, uh, H1 blockers, there's the three of them, and typically you have to use very high dosage of them in order to help shut down the process. Using H2 blockers, we talked about these, and um, using uh, the uh, leukotiriene receptor blockers are also effective. Not listed here that we have to put in here also is chromalin sodium. It's a mast cell stabilizer. We can use chromalin sodium as gastrochrome. It's an oral medication that can be taken, or it can be taken uh, over the counter as a nasal spray uh, that can be used. Uh, but again, it's about layering this stuff. You're not going to do it by just treating one thing. Uh, nutraceuticals, the uh, supplements that have been shown to be useful in stabilizing mast cells, quercetin, luteo, rut rutin, and PEA. All very effective. PEA is particularly effective in maintaining the homeostasis, the balance between the functioning of the mast cells and the microglia. So these are supplements that can all be effective in treating and creating mast cell stabilization. PEA in particular, is, as I talked about, is particularly interesting. It's an endogenous fatty acid amine uh, found in soybeans, egg yolks, and peanuts. Uh, down regulates mast cell activity and controls microglial cell uh, behaviors. It creates homeostasis between the two of them. It may play a role in maintaining cellular homeostasis, acting as a mediator of resolution of inflammatory processes. These are the dosages that we typically use utilizing PEA. Quercetin, these again are the dosages that we'll utilize uh, in the process of treating. And again, this is not based on opinion. This is the reading of the literature. All of this is very carefully studied and all of this is very carefully documented. The therapies, meditation, exercise, sleep hygiene, and psychotherapy. Meditation is neuroregenerative. Meditation shuts down the inflammatory process in the central nervous system. But if you jump to this step without having addressed the problems that are existing in the system in terms of creating the inflammatory process, it won't work or it will work partially at best. Okay? So now, and, and in the fact of that young woman I talked about early on where she went through this incredibly rigorous physical therapy program to shut down the inflammatory process, yeah, it worked only to a point because they never addressed the ideologic factors, the things that created the problem to begin with. So everything was coming back. Once we addressed the ideologic factors, everything else worked. But this is necessary as part of the total healing experience. So mindfulness meditation, a lot of studies on this stuff, uh, engages multiple unique brain mechanisms that attenuates the subjective experience of pain, 
Long-term meditation influences the dimension of self-reported pain. It reduces it. Increased activation of the prefrontal cortex during the state of mindfulness and during rest after uh, mindfulness interventions reduces rumination and emotional act activity and reactivity. It actually builds resilience into the system. So long-term meditation is very good at quieting down an inflamed brain. Engages cortical thalamic cortical uh, interactions to reduce pain through mechanisms such as inhibitory control, or reappraisal to close the gate, if you will. All very technical explanations, but the fact of the matter is the research is there, the studies are there, it does work, and it works via the neurophysiology. All right, movement. Movement is an exercise, aerobic exercise, is extremely powerful in reducing inflammation in the central nervous system. Extremely effective in reducing it. So we want to get people up and moving. Now, if you've got chronic fatigue syndrome, the worst thing we can do is, is push you. All right? Everything's about pacing, not pushing. So we have to be attentive to the individual sitting in front of us. We have to see how they respond as we're recommending various therapies. But we've got to be respectful of what the individual can and can't do. But actually, ongoing meditation can protect you. Exercise can protect you against developing chronic pain. It reduces inflammation in the brain and the body and improves results. It builds resilience is really what it does. And, surprise, surprise, it modifies the gut microbiome. All of this stuff is connected. Benefits of yoga, also well documented. Reduction in anxiety and depression, not creating it. Reduction in low back pain, reduction in headaches and migraine. All of these things have been studied looking at yoga with good outcomes. Supplements your nutraceuticals for sleep. If you're not sleeping, you are inflamed. You may be not sleeping because you are inflamed, but not sleeping also causes you to become inflamed. So that if you're having trouble falling asleep and staying asleep, if you're waking up multiple times during the night, if you're getting short sleep cycles, if you're getting chaotic sleep cycles, all of this is going to influence the occurrence of inflammation, but also can be caused by inflammation. So we've got to work it from both ends. What can we do in order to help you to sleep? Certainly meditation can be helpful, certainly exercise, but there's also a number of nutraceuticals that can be very effective. If we're giving anything along the lines of tryptophan supplementation, we always use 5-hydroxytryptophan. Why? Because there is a pathway in the brain when it's under stress that it goes called the kinetic pathways and ends up producing a substance which is neurotoxic. So we don't ever want to give tryptophan. We want to give 5-hydroxytryptophan. It's a step down in the process that doesn't go in the direction of creating uh, the kinetic acid pathway. Okay? So <clears throat> phosphatidylserine, L-theanine, kava-kava, all of these things can help quiet the brain using nutraceuticals as opposed to medications. We know that long-term use of the benzodiazepines, long-term use of the sleep aids, okay, all produce uh, a five-year increase uh, in what it does is short, it in higher risk of shortened mortality, meaning that it'll take about five years off your life. So chronic use of the benzodiazepines is a profoundly bad idea. We're not sure what the mechanism is, but we do know that it occurs in very large studies. So using the Ambien and the Linest and the other sleep aids, short term is one thing, long term, not a good idea at all. There are better medications to utilize that. And the other thing about sleep is sleep isn't about, you know, I'm awake, I'm asleep. There's a thing called sleep cycles, and there's stages two, three, four, and REM. And we want to preserve those cycles. And so we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep the balance and the architecture of sleep in functioning as well as the amount of time you're sleeping. The other thing, of course, is sleep apnea. We want to make sure that you're not suffocating in your sleep. If you're snoring loudly, if you're waking up still exhausted, if you're sleepy during the day and falling asleep on and off during the day, you stop at the stoplight at night and you doze off, you stop uh, <coughs> for a moment in traffic and you doze off, you have, you're at a meeting and you doze off, although some are perhaps warranted, but most of the time <laughs> you shouldn't be falling asleep under these circumstances. And if that's happening to you on an ongoing basis, get checked for sleep apnea. Go talk to your doctor, find out what's going on. There's a lot of things that need to be paid attention to. 
with regards to a lot of different sleep disturbances. It's important that a proper sleep history be part of every medical workup. Diet. There's lots of different diets. And they can be pretty ominous in terms of keeping them in place. And so working with a nutritionist in order to get proper guidance is essential in the process of getting better. What do we take from all of these things? Basically, freshly cooked meat and fish, organic foods, good quality protein and good quality fats, coconut oil, uh, olive oil, fresh fruits and vegetables, a lot on the list, hydration, you gotta be drinking, all right? You can't be getting dehydrated all day long. And avoiding wheat when possible, why? We have poisoned our food supply. I have patients who go overseas, have their croissants and have no problems, but can't touch the things here, why? Because they don't allow for GMOs overseas. Are GMOs a bad thing? In and of themselves, no evidence. But the problem with GMOs is that they make the plant resistant to the pesticides and the herbicides. And so we can dump tons of that on, which increases crop yield. But we now know that that stuff gets into the food supply. We know that it enters the plant and it ends up on the shelf with all the processing. The glycophosphates, the most commonly used herbicide, end up in our food supply. And I think that a very large number of our patients who are glucose and, or, um, gluten intolerant, and mind you, 1% of the population has true celiac disease, but about 6 to 8% of the population is, is gluten intolerant. Those individuals may in fact not be intolerant to gluten, they may be intolerant to glycophosphates. So it turns out that herbicides aren't a good thing for you. We are poisoning our food supply. Our fish, massive problem. From all the coal burning we've been doing, we've dumped a ton of mercury into the atmosphere. That falls down into the oceans and the waters. The guys at the top are the ones who are accumulating the most mercury in their system. Tuna fish, swordfish, sharks, trout. All right? These are fish which have, through the process of the food chain, it's worked up and concentrated in the highest amounts. The FDA tells pregnant women not to eat more than two cans of tuna fish a week because of the mercury content of tuna fish. Why should any of us be eating tuna fish? Mercury is not healthy in us in any amounts. Lead is not healthy in us in any amounts. So we need to be attentive to the damage we've been doing to our environment. We need to be attentive to what we've been taking in in terms of our food and what we're breathing into our, in our air. So environmental toxins are a big deal. Let's get it out. And by the way, rice, rice is a phenomenal chelator. If you have arsenic in your soil, Rice will suck it right out of the soil into the rice, which you now eat. We have been poisoning ourselves. I had a woman come to see me who had been doing NGO work in Eastern Europe for years. She had a cancer that was completely non-responsive to three rounds of chemotherapy. I said to her, you've got heavy metal poisoning. And she said, no, 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 we eat organic. I said, well, that's lovely, except that the soil you're growing your stuff in is poisoned. Let's look. She had the highest records of mercury and lead in her system of anybody we've seen in this office to date in 30 years. If you grow it in poison soil, you end up with poison plants. So you've got to be careful where your food's coming from. Ideally, the simple way we tell people to shop is the periphery. This piece of wisdom given to me many years ago by my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Lisa Lillenfield, Simplest piece of information I've ever heard and the most profound in terms of the easiest way to go about being healthy. Shop the periphery of the store. That's where all the produce is. That's where all the frozen is. Okay? Stay in that area. Oops. So we get back. We have to treat from a top down and a bottom up. We have spent our entire time today talking about this. This is crucial because this is the piece that the entire profession doesn't get. This is the piece that until we get this, we will never, ever, ever solve the problem of chronic pain and depression. This is the piece that we can focus on now. Perfectly, no. But by focusing on this, we will get many more people better and we will get much more complete results in treating these individuals.
We will get better and better at doing this, but now we know where to go look. This is frequently the smoke, the extremity that hurts, the arm that hurts, but sometimes it is the problem. And so utilizing techniques such as regenerative medicine, osteopathic manipulative therapy, physical therapy, nerve blocks, triggers, all of this can be effective and needs to be part of a comprehensive chronic pain program. So you need to treat bottom up as well as top down. So again, we're back to one, two, three. Identify the problems that started the fire because the problem is neuroinflammatory disease of a lot of different causes. Once you've identified them, treat them, all of them. That includes the parasite, that includes the infections, that includes the toxins, that includes the gut, and that includes the psychological issues, all of them. And then we know we've got a wildfire burning, and so you've got to go put that out. And again, nutrition, exercise, meditation, sleep as the foundations. And then there's a number of different medications and supplements that can also be particularly effective. Now we know our targets, mast cells, microglia. There will be more, but this is at least the beginning of being able to shut this process down. I thank you for your attention. I hope this has been useful.